Hello everyone and welcome to this Australian Biocommons workshop on online data analysis for biologists. My name is Melissa Burke, I'm the Australian Biocommons Training Manager and I'll be your host for today. Before we begin, I will take a moment to pause and acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we are all joining this workshop from today. For me, this is the Turrbal and Yuggera people. On behalf of everyone, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. This workshop is being brought to you by the Australian Biocommons National Bioinformatics Training Cooperative, and it is part of a series of events that the Biocommons provides with the goal of uplifting life science research in Australia. So leading you through today's workshop is Dr. Gareth Price. Gareth is the project lead for Galaxy Australia, where his, where his role is to ensure that the service is meeting the needs of the research community. Gareth has more than 20 years of experience in bioinformatics and genomics research and has worked on a variety of model and non-model organisms. Joining Gareth to help answer your questions is Mike Tang from QCIF and from Galaxy Australia. Mike is a computational biologist and like Gareth, he has many years of experience in ex supporting researchers to, with their bioinformatics analyses and has a deep understanding of Galaxy Australia. So as you have probably guessed, this workshop focuses on the use of Galaxy Australia for the analysis of biological data. Galaxy Australia is a free web-based platform that lets you conduct accessible, reproducible and transparent computational biological research. It is used worldwide and it gives you access to thousands of popular tools and compute for analysis and processing of your data. Galaxy Australia is part of is one of the Australian Biocommons services, and it is made possible by collaborations with a number of operational and computational partners, and by funding through the University of Melbourne, Melbourne and from NCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia. That is all the housekeeping I have to share with you. So it's just leaves me to say, enjoy the workshop and to hand you over to Gareth to get you started using Galaxy. Thank you, Melissa. And afternoon and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I quite enjoy giving these workshops. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this next few hours. I hope you are too. Um, despite enjoying them, which I genuinely do, uh, we are talking about whole new software environment, a new product, a new service. And I've started to view exposure to Galaxy a bit like sitting down the first time to use Excel or Word or Adobe Photoshop. There is a little bit of investment in getting through the basics. And that's the intention of today. So I really do welcome your fun questions about your particular biology as we get into the Q&A session. But what we're really doing today is landing, laying down a good foundation of operating in Galaxy so that you can leverage uh, the places we'll end up like the Galaxy Training Network, which has hundreds of very well-supported tutorials to talk you through and coach you through pieces of work. Well, this has already mentioned that uh, Galaxy Australia is part of a global service. Uh, there are other very large galaxies around the world and um, they all cooperate to bring the best tools and the best infrastructure for, for everyone. What I thought I would start with, and it's somewhat of a circular argument because you're here to learn about Galaxy, but why use Galaxy? Why not do all your RNA-seq data in Excel, which by the way, is a very bad idea. Why not do your proteomics in commercial software, which you may not all have access to? So. One of the more proud activities we do within Galaxy and the larger biocommons is track uh, those publications where people have been good enough to cite Galaxy Australia. So I've gone and grabbed uh, from the URL on my screen here, just a couple of the most recent publications. So these are the last six to eight months and they're deliberate 
they are there to show you that we do proteomics and metabolomics in Galaxy Australia. We do genomics and we really just do data analysis. And this one was quite a fascinating paper to read, which was looking really using Galaxy just to leverage large data set manipulation and data visualization. So if you're intrigued by what fellow researchers in Australia are doing, please don't go have a look at this list, get inspired by the way they're working and bring some of that to Galaxy. Once you're in Galaxy and once we have grounded you in the basics today, uh, the place you're going to want to return to fairly frequently is the Galaxy training network. And we'll be having this open on our screen fairly shortly, so don't need to rush into it. I thought I'd highlight that there's a fairly recent publication on the Galaxy training network. And uh, again, if you're curious about what infrastructure Galaxy supports for training, do follow this paper up. There are over 400 tutorials on Galaxy contributed by people, nearly 400 people globally. Uh, they span topics. So this might be microbiology, proteomics, genome assembly. It includes topics like how to write tools for Galaxy, how to administer your own Galaxy. So there's a lot in there. And down this back end, there are a few really interesting things. So there's learning paths. So if you're at the start of your bioinformatic journey or your analysis journey, I, I strongly recommend the learning path. It takes you through the basics of your analysis, maybe quality control on sequencing reads through to assembly, through to genome annotation and variant calling, the similar processes for uh, proteomics, for example, or other science domains. And there are many videos that also do similar to what we're doing today that help walk you through uh, that content. So with that very short preamble, because you're here to learn and not listen, uh, we are going to operate in Galaxy. Now, as your trainer, I'm going to stay on this one middle screen so that hopefully everything I do, you can see. I have a reasonable amount of info on my secondary screen, mostly around uh, the training queue. So there you go, two open windows. You can still see my Galaxy, great. So a very basic orientation to Galaxy, and I suspect many of you are logged in because that's what I can see uh, happening. Galaxy has a menu system on the left-hand side. Each of these will expand to a series of options. Once it comes, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, and the one we're going to use most frequently today is exploring the tools we need in Galaxy. They're broadly grouped by activity. So text manipulation, genomic file manipulation, genomic analysis, proteomics, so on and so forth. Uh, with some quite fascinating growing tool sets down here in image analysis, climate analysis, et cetera. Skipping ahead, when you want to search for something, the best way to do that is not necessarily try and guess what category it is. Uh, this is a context typing menu, but just type in the activity you want and it will filter to the tools you need. We'll also be making use of, of uploading, so getting data into Galaxy and workflows. Uh, visualizations will perform as well. You will not necessarily have these buttons down the bottom. This is admin privilege, so don't worry if you can't see all the buttons. The middle panel toggles between uh, the landing page and tool setup. Let's just show tool setup. Go for a classic like class QC. This shows you a tool setup. There's nothing to be done here because on the right hand side of the screen in our history, in Galaxy's uh, terminology, history you could view as a lab book. So you would have a history per experiment or per analysis type. History, if you're more computer inclined, could be viewed as a folder structure where you bring in your files, uh, your raw files, and your manipulated uh, end results. So history will be operating in. 
but this one's empty. So the tool itself is an empty tool at the moment. That's a very well wind introduction to Galaxy. Uh, we will be going through each of these features in more detail as we come to them. I wanted to highlight uh, the fact that I've already said this multiple times, we will be accessing Galaxy training today. There are multiple ways to do this within Galaxy. So when we go back to Galaxy Australia, you'll see there's a little academic hat icon and I'll show you that shortly. That brings up Galaxy Training as a pop-up window in the middle of your screen. You can also open it up as an individual tab in whatever browser you have. Here it is within the service. Let's make my screen a little bigger. This is actually quite a great function because it means that when you're learning, you're also not leaving Galaxy. It is not going to be my preference to use this today uh, as it's a little bit variable on each browser instance to how big this is and how to escape out of it if it covers too much of your screen. So I will be operating out of a separate tab. because It makes it easier for, I believe, everyone to see where I'm up to. Your choice uh, for today, this is the physical orientation I'm going with. The tutorial we are going to walk through has a couple of names, Galaxy Basics for Everyone or Galaxy 101. It's the same tutorial. It is this one here, Galaxy Basics for Everyone. We're going to walk our way through this tutorial. It's roughly split into two sections, which is going to take us up to the Q&A and the break. We're going to familiarize as I saw with Galaxy, run some tools, build a history, and these activities at the end, creating workflows and sharing your data, we're going to do after the break. So really, our end point before break is you should have a good orientation of where to do things in Galaxy, how to find and access a tool, manipulate your histories and get comfortable with that center panel. Uh, we'll show you multiple ways to upload data into your service. Um, we are going to set up a couple of procedural activities, which on the face of it, I acknowledge look like overheads at the start, but really pay dividends later in your complex analysis. And one of those is how to track your data using hashtags. We'll run some tools and look at the various ways that inside Galaxy, you can look at your analysis. And I hope no one's getting too uh, car sick or seasick with me jumping between screens. So please do tell me if I'm rushing through that. A little bit of orientation on your GTN tutorials. Um, obviously the objectives we've already covered. Time estimation is a pretty good estimate if you're sitting down and doing this yourself. Uh, all the data sets, workflows, recordings, et cetera, are all available and you can see just how up to date this workflow is. So it was first published five years ago and it's been updated only a couple of months ago. It does have a persistent URL. So if you want to cite this uh, in your own training material, delivering to students or coworkers, you can do that. Uh, if you want to put it in a publication or a thesis, you can also do that. So with that, uh, we're going to get started and work our way through the tutorial. Again, just as a, a reminder, with the risk of sounding defensive, this is about setting up good practice in the software. The actual data we're going to analyze, you can debate at length how exciting that data set is to you. Uh, hint, it's a botany data set. So if you like botany, hopefully you're more excited. Right. Um, so what does Galaxy look like? I think we've fairly established all that. So it has the tools on the left side, that main window for explorative interaction and your history on the right-hand side. We are going to create a history and we're gonna go through these steps uh, one at a time. So uh, the orientation of the training network, it's trying to challenge you trying to let you learn. So we will have an activity 
make sure you start with an empty history. If you're ever struggling for how to do that activity, they are hidden under these expandable boxes. So challenge yourself, listen to me, or use this as a backup. So we're going to create a new history and we're going to rename your history. And um, as someone who obviously, maybe not obvious, someone who does spend a lot of time in Galaxy, I can say renaming your history and giving it an informative name is an extremely valuable activity. Like all of us that label an Eppendorf tube one to 10 thinking that we're going to remember or label a folder called temp or something like that, you will forget. So back in Galaxy, we have our history on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, for those of you just curious, there are expandable bars on either side of the screen. I'm just gonna bring my history just a little bit bigger uh, so I can see it easier. And hopefully you're starting to get an orientation, but there will be pencil icons throughout Galaxy hinting that this is an editable item. In this particular case, I've taken the lazy attitude of copying the text from the training tutorial. I haven't written it out. Uh, I can add any kind of annotation. So I might, for example, put today's start date and Biocommons workshop. That's for you to address how much uh, rich metadata you need. I can only encourage you to add it. And now I have a tutorial that's a little easier for me to remember in the weeks and months ahead of why I created this one and what it contains. No questions, great. Um, so the first activity, and this is both necessary um, and it's gonna be a little bit belabored by myself, is how do we get data into Galaxy? Galaxy has been named a bring your own data service. So hopefully in that hint, you realize you do have to bring your data to Galaxy. There are on behalf of, of the researchers and universities in Australia, we do host data libraries. We host pages, uh, sorry, histories and pages. Our data libraries are often there to support uh, university training or large uh, research consortiums. But in this case, we are going to focus on uploading a data, uploading data directly into your Galaxy instance. The upload functionality uh, brings up multiple options. We have options up the top, which we're not really going to go into today. Uh, these are more sophisticated ways of combining your data once it arrives into Galaxy. The three heavy lifting buttons are down the bottom. Choose local file, choose remote files, or paste and fetch data. But these might all be obvious, but I'll step through them. So choose local files goes to your local computer. That can be a challenge if the data you're bringing in is larger than your local computer has an option to host, but it can be very useful for small files. Choose remote files takes you to a list of pre-configured uh, access points, both within Australia and globally. So uh, you will note uh, Griffith Uni uh, in Queensland is on this list. We'll be expanding this over time to include other Australian universities. But this basically requires either access publicly to a, a website like Thousand Genomes or configuration to your own personal Dropbox uh, location. So that can be quite attractive if you're bringing in large data sets. The option we're going to use today and the one that you will experience the most when uh, using the Galaxy Training Network is paste and fetch data. The paste and fetch data uh, brings up its own dialog box for which you can paste in anything. If you need a list of letters, you can paste that in. If you forgot that you needed a metadata file with, uh, you know, a simple age, 
add sample sex, et cetera, you could just add it in, pardon me, sorry, add it in as you're going. We are going to make use of the fact that Galaxy can import from any uh, discoverable URL. So if this website requires a username or a password, unfortunately, uh, we need to do some more configuration to support that in Galaxy. If it's a public URL, be it an image, a PDF, a CSV, fast queue collection, doesn't matter, it can be brought into the service. All we need to do is copy that URL and paste it into the dialog box. We can name the file, um, but we will name it in the history. We can force the file type, and apologies um, for last pass getting in the way there. And we can specify the genome. All these things are relatively unnecessary uh, unless you have a strong desire to do this upfront. Generally, the best practice is just bring your data in, inspect it, then start on manipulation. This also can be a list of URLs. So it can be 10, 100, however many different files you have. So with that, I'm hoping everyone's caught up and I will hit start. The two things happen, Galaxy goes green because it's executed that command successfully. If I close this box, in the background that I have a file in my history, uh, we'll talk about the color coding in a minute, but essentially this orange color is active something is being processed and green is it's successfully completed. It may not surprise you if that's the case that red is completed but with some logged error and we can discuss what those are later. So we have brought our first file into Galaxy. We're going to be asked to just rename it and you'll see why in a minute we're going to rename it to Iris and we're going to confirm that the data a type is a CSV file. So we're going to do activities two and three. So in the first instance, you'll note that Galaxy has stripped the URL address from it. We've just landed at the file name, but we still have the file type. Arguably, that's absolutely fine to have CSV. We are just cleaning it up uh, for visual benefit. And also sometimes because the suffix can be quite long. You'll also note as I'm been talking, um, I clicked on the file name or on that history item, iris.csv, and brought up something on my screen called a data peak. Uh, I can almost not emphasize just how valuable the data peak is within Galaxy. As uh, operators of the help desk, uh, we deal with those tools that do fail for users and a good majority of those failures, I'm going to say, unfortunately, is back on the user for not inspecting their data and confirming it's actually the appropriate data set that they want to perform an action on. So having a data peak tells me a little bit, tells me I have a 150 line file with five columns and one comment line, and it confirms that Galaxy read this as a CSV file. And I get a little bit of a peak, hence the name, at the data. If I want to, I can view the complete data set by clicking on the eye icon, and then it changes the middle panel to the complete data set. In my case, or in all cases, if you're following along, this data set is actually only 150 lines long, and it's highly visible on my screen. Fairly easy to imagine in a uh, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, any sort of omics field that you're going to have a data set much, much larger than 150 lines. The eye icon is not an effective way to explore very large data sets. And in fact, if it is quite large, only the first megabyte will be shown. But it is a good way to understand if you have brought in structure in your data. Skipping to the end, the third icon is delete. I hope that's fairly obvious what that will do. And we're going to operate back on our pencil icon to edit this particular file. When we edit the file, we can actually do a lot of things. Uh, we're going to go with the most basic, which is change the name just to Iris. Uh, we could 
provide some more information or we could annotate and we could annotate by actually adding the source from where we downloaded this file so we remember that for the future again we can adjust the database so this is keying keying your file to a particular genome uh, we can address that in the q a why that might be important but as i said it's generally unnecessary and we're going to save this file and not surprisingly it didn't do much apart from green box attributes updated and the file name has changed i know that's a lot of talking to get through the first steps but you'll see why in a moment uh, we changed the data type. We're not changing the data type as it was successfully detected as a CSV file. What we're going to do next is step four, which is add a tag, a hashtag to this file called hashtag iris. The note down here is worth addressing before we do this work. So you can add a tag without the word iris. Oh, sorry. You can add a tag without a hashtag. And this tag you add will only be specific to that data set. If you add uh, a tag with the hashtag in front, any subsequent you data you derive based on that original data set will carry the hashtag through. This can be really very powerful if you're dealing with a large cohort of files or a different collection of files from different individuals, different ages, different treatments. Those tags will propagate through your whole history and make uh, later analysis or discovery of your history a lot. Easier. We're going to do that now. If we were on the condensed history, you wouldn't see that option. If you open up that item by clicking on it to see that data peak, you'll see the add tags option. Everything in my list is stuff I've done before. So I only add hashtag iris. And that's it. Uh, I can't confirm what color you'll get. I think we all operate on the same color wheel. Don't get too worried by the color. Uh, as you add more tags, it just works its way through a color wheel of assigning colors. So that's all we've really done is the highly necessary and somewhat underwhelming activity of bringing data into Galaxy. But the most important thing to do that we've done to me is we've inspected that data set and confirmed that Hopefully it conforms to our understanding of what we imported. With that in mind, uh, we do now need to get into some, I guess, uh, not galaxy trickery, more computer trickery. So for every tool that exists in Galaxy, and we have just shy of 2000 tools on Galaxy Australia at the moment, every single one of these tools will be keyed to, by which I mean expecting a particular data set type to be available. So I have literally kick, clicked on one at random. I see principal component analysis, and it is saying it needs a matrix file, and it cannot find a matrix file in my history. So you do need to be aware if you're running a tool, you obviously need the right data. And again, in many cases, you might believe you have the right data, but it might not be in a format that Galaxy recognizes is appropriate for the tool you want to operate on. So the activity we're going to do now is convert the format from CSV into a format that the downstream tools can access, and that is a tabular file. For simple files like uh, CSVs, this is accessed through data set attributes. For complex tools like fast C collections, BAM files, single cell data, or proteomics data, you'll find an, a specific tool that does that manipulation. In this particular case, we're going to go to data type we can assign a data type so we can force a data type, but we're not doing that. So we're not saying, even though I can see this is a CSV file, I'm going to trick Galaxy into pretending it's a PDF. That will force it, but it won't be constructive because 
that won't be accessible to the tools that need it. So we're going to convert it, convert to tabular and create data set. Nothing else needed to do, except you will note that the conversion process writes a new file. So you haven't lost your original file. It's actually a new file, uh, exactly the same, except this time now the format is listed as tabular. And you'll also note that something else has changed. The file has gone to 151 lines. So important reminders, you're not losing your original data. Uh, and this conversion process will take as long as the size of your data set. So we're operating on a very small data set, not going to take long. If you're operating on a mega a gigabase data set, then rewriting that is going to take longer. So we have been asked to do th two things, convert it, rename it, and view it. Three things in total. We've already converted it. So now we are going to rename this data set to tabular. Apologies if I'm doing the lazy option of just copy and paste. Uh, you can type out tabular as well. And we've been asked to view it. And the reason we've been asked to view the file is to have it noted that when this file was a CSV, and this applies to many file formats, so it's not unique to comma separated value files, the CSV was recognized as having a header row. So the columns are presented as, uh, sorry, column titles are presented as the header row. This is not a duplication, it's still 150 plus one. As tabular though, Tabula treats this all as data until we tell it if there's a header row. So now we're back to columns one, two, three, four, and five. Those column headings are trapped inside the data and hence the difference in total rows, 150, 151. This is fine. And if this is a VCF file, it might have 20 or 30 lines in the header file. So it's all good, it's just something to note. And that's what the solution will say. The file had one header line. It only contains column names. But if we want to manipulate this data, and again, a CSV file, maybe you want to do this to a BAM file that has many, many lines of header or a VCF file, for example, we want to remove the beginning. And this is the first tool that we're going to run in Galaxy. So I'll I'll show you this a couple of times so you get orientated to tool usage. If your history is getting a bit big, you can just collapse those items for niceness, that's all. So the tool we have been asked to run was called Remove Beginning. We should be able to discover this simply by typing remove. And you'll find that in fact, there's an awful lot of tools on Galaxy that do some form of removal. Conveniently, the one we want is at the top of the list, remove beginning of a file. So uh, if you're following along, you've clicked on remove beginning and you've got your first access to a tool form. Because this is the first tool form we've come across, I'm just going to take a moment for orientation. So. Galaxy will always provide you with a default option in boxes. Boxes will not be empty. So please do watch. If the default for this was remove the first thousand lines, you will end up with an empty file. So do check that the default is a, something relevant to the question you're asking. In this case, it was one line. And Galaxy has picked the file. And this is the next place that we're going to come across uh, in today's today's activity is Galaxy will always pick the uppermost, so the file with the highest number that conforms to the format that this tool can take. So it's easy in this case, Galaxy only takes iris tabula, uh, sorry, tabular data. So it's presented me that option. There are a number of things to do down the bottom. And again, we won't explore this exhaustively on every tool. We're just doing it on the first one. Um, 
You can set to be emailed when the tool is finished. Uh, in this particular case, I'm going to say, please don't worry about this. The tool will be finished in quicker than it takes you to open your email. But for a long running uh, job that requires, say, GPU access, like uh, 3D protein visualization with AlphaFold, you might want to turn this on just so you get a prompt that the tool is finished uh, and you're reminded to come back to Galaxy. Uh, this next option is about uh, complex training events. Really what I wanted to show is that about halfway down your screen will be run tool. But under run tool are a couple of important things. And there's always a help section, which is fantastic. So please do refer to this for information about how the tool works. And we'll look at a, a more lengthy tool in a minute. Uh, quite a newish feature, but quite exciting is what tutorials on the Galaxy Training Network make use of this tool. So if this is if you've discovered the tool not through the training network, but through your Galaxy exploration, and you don't quite understand how it works or how you use it, you can head to the training network to find out how other people have used the tool. And right, right down the bottom, there are requirements, and we'll look at a more lengthy tool in a minute also has citations. So uh, if you're curious about the source of the tool or the primary publication that tool came from, that will be listed down the bottom. And we'll, we'll go and have a look at one of those in a minute, just so you can see a better example. I've talked sufficiently for a very bland tool. So let's hit run tool. A couple of things have happened on my screen. You've been notified that it's running. And by the time I talk, this will have finished. You'll also notice this box here, which says these are the typical tools people run after remove beginning. This can be a great way to explore an analysis that you are somewhat unfamiliar with by seeing what do other people normally do after they use this tool. You can actually click on these and it will take you to that specific tool. Case in point. Right. So we have removed the beginning, have removed one line from our file, and we're going to rename the result iris clean. We also might want to actually affect the file. So a couple of things have happened. Uh, the hashtag is propagating upwards. And you'll note that. Our history name is no longer as human informative as we might hope. It's iris, iris tabular, and it's now removed beginning on data two. It's very accurate, but not potentially as useful as you might need. Um, if you're planning to work in a history for a long time, I would recommend that at different times throughout the history in your analysis, you do do some renaming. And you'll see later this afternoon, we're going to do some more sophisticated renaming. I'm going to rename this to Iris Clean. And I'm just going to check out of paranoia that it is actually a clean data set by inspecting it. And the header line is gone. So it looks like it worked. And that's all that activity has done. You will find on the GTN, there's almost always a bulk of activity at the start of each tutorial about preparing your data set for the analysis you're going to do. And that is just the nature of this work is that what comes off a machine is not always ready to go straight into an analysis. So we now have a data set. It's named after a plant. It has five columns. It has numbers in it, and it has some naming at the end of which I could either manually try and scroll and count, which is error prone, or I can get Galaxy to do the work for me. So the first question we're going to ask of our data set is how many different species um, are in the data set? We need to identify which column as the species, column five, we need to tell it how it's separated by tabs, from what file we want to perform the action, and we're going to get that out as an individual new column. Is it possible to set the column names from this tabular data rather than just columns one, two, and three, et cetera? 
Unfortunately, not for the data type we are working on, which is tabular. So tabular strips away any information, any, sorry, assumption about the structure of that data. And it is simply tabular in its nature. Doesn't make any assumptions of numerical, alphanumerical, et cetera. Uh, so you will note, and, and this is a very good question you've asked, that what I will do as I go through the afternoon is I will refer back to our primary data set on occasion to remind myself what the column titles were. And that is a little cumbersome. You'll see by the time we make this into a workflow later that it actually can be scaled quite efficiently. So the tool we're going to use is cut. So tools, cut. Again, there are a lot of cut options and the most basic one is cut and that's what we're going to use. I keep hiding my tool menu uh, that you don't need necessarily need to do that. I'm just doing that because it's helpful for me. So cut, uh, to reiterate what I said before, its default is to cut columns one and column two from a data set identified by tabs. We wish to cut column five tabs on Iris Clean and go. Again, if you want the example down the bottom, it's very helpful. Cutting columns one and three from Apple is good will give you Apple good because you've cut and retained column one and three. Run tool. The gray box you might be seeing in your history or my history as you're watching, gray means that Galaxy has accepted that request and queued the tool, but it's waiting for resources. For these very small files, that's very quick. For Almost every tool on Galaxy, that queue time is very short. Uh, if you are using some of our newer GPU tools uh, for some high-end analysis, then there might be a short wait time. So we have cut on data three. We have 150 lines in one column, and it looks like we've successfully cut out that fifth column. I am quite sure we're going to be asked to rename it. And we are, it is Iris species column. Okay. View the file, we have done that. Um, and we've assured ourselves that we cut out the right column and that's probably going to be the biggest source of potential error that you might experience if you're doing this. So the next one we're going to go to is a tool called Unique. And Unique uh, is going to count the occurrences of each record in this particular file. I'm going to go to Tools, pardon me, Unique. Thank you. File to scan for unique values. Number four, iris species column. Ignore differences in case, yes or no. Con column only contains numerical values, yes or no. In this case, we know that's not the case. And there are potentially some advanced options which we've not been asked to explore now. Um, so not won't drag us on too long. And we're just going to run this tool. Same, we're getting that prompt for things that people do afterwards. When this finishes, we can now see we have only three unique uh, uh, entries in that column or in that data set. Now on 150 lines of data, again, this may not be particularly overwhelming. On the next file we're going to look at, which has 10,000 data points, that's going to be more helpful and beyond manual capacity. On anything you might be doing for heavy lifting real data, this could be millions of data points and just getting a snapshot of unique records is going to be very informative. Uh, also, incidentally, for anyone working with metadata, that might be uh, patient ID, geographical location, uh, 
you know, season that the sample was caught in, this particular column will identify it, sorry, this particular activity will identify if maybe there's some typos in your data because you'll end up with more entries than practically you should be seeing. So we're going to rename the data set iris species. And then we are going to ask ourselves, well, that's great. We, we know there are three particular species in our data set, but we haven't actually addressed how many of each of these we might be seeing. Is it across the 150? Is there 40 of these, 60 of these, and 50 of these, or any other combination of number? This is what we're going to do now, is try to count the number of instances. So yes, we know there are three species, but let's do a bit more. Actually, I'm a little ahead of myself, apologies. We're going to try a different tool first. And the tool we're going to use is called Group on the Clean Data Set. The group, group data by a column and perform aggregate operations on other columns. So a couple of things have happened now. For one, the tutorial is asking us to run this on Iris Clean, but the tool itself has picked Iris Species because Iris Clean is way down here halfway through our history. So this is just that reminder that Galaxy will always pick the top file that, mo that conforms to the tool format. So we have to pick the clean data and we are grouping by column five. Uh, we're not doing anything with group at the moment other than applying the group tool to the data set and asking it to group by the column that we know has species. There is a lot more we can do with this tool and we're going to explore that shortly. So this is queued, running, and going to give us, look at that, it's already given me the result before it's turned green. So uh, in a very overwhelm, uh, sorry, underwhelming result, this has given us exactly what we had before when we cut the column out and applied unique values to that column. And this little exercise really is to remind you that for a number of activities in Galaxy, there's actually multiple ways that you can achieve that result. And with time, you might well look to the way that is most efficient for you. And as I was doing that, apologies, I was coming to get the new prompt name, which is Iris Species Group, and save that. There. Just a little reminder that Galaxy can do things in multiple ways. The first way required us to identify the column and cut it out, generate a new history item and perform an action on that column. The second way on the surface of it seems more efficient because it was a singular tool that did that activity instead of multiple steps. And why that is particularly relevant is because now we can rerun the group tool, and I'll explain what we run in just a minute. We're going to do exactly the same action as before, which is group by column five, but we're going to insert an operation, which is what we skipped over before, which is count the number of entries in column one. Column one can actually be applied to other columns as well. This is going to give us samples per species using the tool group. I'll show that in a bit more detail and also show you the icon which this tool triggers. So when you're looking at your data peak and we've looked at viewing a data set, we've looked at editing a data set, we've looked at tags, formats, etc. We've not explored these particular six icons at the bottom of the data peak. Um, there's a lot of power in a number of these. The first one, uh, the old floppy disk and that's download to your computer. That should be fairly obvious. If you need that data set, please capture that data set. The information button tells you a lot about 
how the analysis was performed. Most of this you won't necessarily need, but if you have a, a, a tool error, you might well find the source of the error in information. And it is certainly where we go as administrators looking to do troubleshooting. This is not particularly overwhelming for this tool, but if those of you on the call are familiar with command line or learning command line, the information button does show you the command line syntax that was used to execute this tool. Um, in this particular case, it's simply saying execute Python using a particular Python tool, grouping.py, on a data set with variables column five, zero, and none. I, if you are interested in upskilling your command line skills, something like this particular function is absolutely great. If you're running an RNAC, uh, again, any proteomics or genomic tool, because you can get the syntax of how that tool is used. Um, in this particular case, you know, the pathways are not going to be relevant to you, but the syntax around how executing the variables are. And the question is, the grouping didn't work. Uh, I'm, I'll repeat the grouping just now, almost at a guess. It will let's double check the input data we're using. So if you just follow along, Himmel, um, if I got that right, apologies or not. Um, we're going to do this activity. Let's see if this one works and then that might address your troubleshooting. So we have been asked to rerun the group tool, but add some additional parameters. So I was down to information. The next button I wanted to talk about is run job again. If you click on the rerun icon, uh, again, this is one that's hard to understate how valuable or overstate how valuable this icon is. So it implies you're gonna run the tool again, but actually what it's doing is pulling out every specific variable you've inputted into the tool form and populate that again. So on this, fairly under, underwhelming, we're just doing something basic. On a very complex differential gene expression where you're setting up groups and replicates, uh, p-values for significance, and you might want to iteratively work through group comparisons, A versus B, A versus C, B versus C, et cetera, rerun is absolutely awesome because everything will be the same and you only need to change the one thing you need to change. So uh, this button is a great friend if you're doing repeated analysis inside Galaxy. So in this particular case, uh, the tool was set up uh, with Iris Clean. And just remember that, yeah, if there's going to be a source of error, it is most likely that the wrong file has been picked here. You need a file with five columns. So come down to Iris Clean, confirm it is five columns and confirm that it is tabular because it does not have the heading line. Grouping by column five. Um, and this time, however, we're going to add an operation. The operation we're going to do is any number of these things. Apologies, you're not seeing them very well there. But we're going to do count on column one, round result to the nearest integer. That's not necessarily at this point, but could be. Uh, and we're going to run this tool. You'll note that you could add more operations if you want to. So when we do that, we have rerun the group tool, but we've now added some complexity to it by asking it to perform a secondary activity, which is counting the number of entries in group one. Before I go to rename it, I'm going to go have a look at the result. And the result now is species in column one. We already knew that, but now we have a count of the number of records of each of those species, 50, 50, 50. So in my mind, using group is more efficient than cutting out a particular column and identifying unique records, but there may be value to both those approaches depending on the complexity of your data set.
going to follow the prompts and rename this file. I know at the risk of jumping around a bit, if your history is starting to get a bit expanded and you find you're spending a lot of time scrolling up and down through your history, uh, this little collapse icon will just shrink everything up on your screen and make it a little easier to find what you need to find. And that's what we're told the solution is 50, 50, 50. So we've explored our data. We've done it on a small data set that's easy to execute. Hopefully you take the mental leap that this could be particularly valuable for data set sizes um, that are much larger. Uh, we will be continuing on him also. If you have the clean data set working, that's fine. Um, you can always uh, regenerate it. So thank you. I'm glad you got there. But these are the kinds of little things that we see um, in uh, individual files don't work. You sometimes don't notice till a few steps later. So let's actually pause and talk about the data set. So we've just been naming it, it's Iris Flowers. It actually does come from a particular collection reference down here where there are three different species of iris flowers. They can be, well, they can be measured by different physical features. They can be measured by petal length and petal width, sepal length and sepal width. From the picture, we may assume that one or more of these four features helps us differentiate the species, but we don't know that because we haven't actually looked at the data yet. So petal length, petal width, width, sepal length, width, sepal length. So we're going to do some exploring of the data. We're going to do this by uh, what's going to look like a fairly large tool. And you'll see the overhead initially in setting this tool up. Um, the punchline of this is that we are also setting up a repeatable analysis for other data sets that we might have that sit the same format. And we'll be using one of those later in this session. So you're going to see me toggle a lot between this particular screen here and my Galaxy window. This is one that I find it requires a little bit of repetition. So bear with me. Uh, watch me maybe the first time and I'm going to repeat it a second time. So we are using a tool called Data Mesh to perform a series of operations tabular data. Hopefully you're already starting to get the, the feel of Galaxy. You identify your data set. You identify a field to action on. We're going to describe our data set. And again, don't worry, I'm going to repeat this more than once. Describe our data set, and then we are going to perform an operation on each of the groups in our data. We're presented with one operation. We can add a second operation. We can add a third. If we got a little bit click happy, we can easily delete an operation. And we can also reorder them if that is something we felt was necessary to have in our final data set in a particularly convenient order for ourselves. So everything on this screen here is about setting up that data mesh tool. Essentially, what it says is my input data is the iris tabula. So it's one of these ones all the way back at the start with that column heading with everything data in it. It has five columns, so we're gonna group by five we're going to sort the input, so that'll make sense in a minute. It has a header line. So yes, in this case, we don't need to use the clean version because the data mesh tool can skip a header line. We're going to actually ask the output to print the header line so that when we've got our final result, we don't have columns one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but rather we have a header line that we can read in English. 
We could print all the files from the input. No, we're not going to choose to do that. And again, we're going to ignore case when grouping. So this one's a little bit of a throwaway in this case because we've inspected our data. And when we inspect our data, for example, here, we can see that we have only three species and there's no uppercase or lowercase variations in that naming, but it certainly can't hurt to turn it on. And then we're going to calculate the mean on column one, the standard deviation on column one, the mean on column two, standard deviation on column two, and so on till we reach the end of column four. What's columns one, two, three, and four? Well, that's the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. So essentially we're asking for the mean standard deviation of the physical characteristics of the flower for these particular three iris species. And we do that with data mesh. So always, the first thing is tabula. It has five fields, comma separated list. There's always hopefully a little bit of a reminder under the, the option you need to do. If there's not, scroll right down to the help section and see if the help section identifies for you the uh, query you have. Sort input. Input file must be sorted by the grouping columns. Enable this to automatically sort. So yes, let's ask for some automated sorting. Yes, it has a header line. I would like to see the header line in my output. I do not want to see all the fields. So I don't want all 150 lines in my output. Ignore case. And this option isn't presented in the tutorial, but uh, we could skip empty values. So we've set that up correctly. So it's yes, 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 no, yes from the top. And now we're going to come to our operations. Uh, how you perform this really up to you, but this is how I'm going to do it. So I need to do mean and standard deviation on column one. So mean, driving me bonkers on column one at an operation standard deviation there's multiple deviations sample standard deviation on column one so this is our operation so we've now asked data mesh to compute for sepal length the mean value and the sample standard deviation you could add a third one and go mean again on column two now. And then remember to go to sample standard deviation. Oops, sample, sorry. On column two. And this is, oh, yeah. I don't know if you have this problem, Mike, but there you go. So I've set up now four operations on my screen for one, two for column one, two for column two. I actually personally find it easier to add all eight operations and then step through my pairs. But it's really up to you how you choose to do that. So I'm just gonna do it because my screen is endlessly trying to populate with my Password manager, which is not particularly helpful on column. And you just say last pass temporarily, Gareth. I don't know how. I'm sorry, Melissa. I might take an opportunity in the break to do that. Okay, we can explore that. Um so uh, but yeah, it's it's a new bug because why wouldn't that be the case? This might be a good point to point out that if you do find a bug in Galaxy, send a little email to help at genome.edu.au to let them know. 
and that way that, they can try and fix it for you. <laughs> yes, that would be great. Um, can you can you sign out a pass last pass or one pass? Yeah, I'll, I'll try that in a minute. I just don't want to be showing all that on my screen. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's all right, Mike. It's all good suggestions. Okay. Um, it certainly wasn't this buggy yesterday, so I don't know why last pass has got more aggressive today. Okay, so with all that, uh, hopefully you have been following along. I now have eight operations. That may not have been obvious from the training material, but we have four columns of data and we're doing two operations on each column. So we will have eight operations in total. They are mean, standard deviation on column one, mean, standard deviation column two, same again on column three, and same again on column four. I could reorder these. So all the means are first and all the standard deviations later. That's sort of the level of customization you have. You also, arguably, don't get too worried if there's a typo or a mistake because that wonderful rerun button will allow you to repeat the analysis and correct that one little error that slipped in when you were setting it up. Other than that, we're going to run this tool. Just going to refresh my screen. Uh, right, so our data mesh has finished nice and clean. It has four lines and nine columns, nine columns because we have an original grouping column, which is species. And we now have mean standard deviation, mean standard deviation across the various features in our data set. Standard deviation is to an ad nauseum amount of decimal places, but uh, at least we have some values and maybe some hints that there is something in this data that differentiates our three species like petal length. So again, we're so write the large data set down to a small collection of values. I'm not quite sure we're going to be asked to rename this, and we are indeed, to Iris Summary and Statistics. Clear my screen of some stuff, sorry. All right. Um, can we differentiate the different species? Well, possibly, but it argument, arguably it's very qualitative. We're just inspecting that data by hand. We've not done a definitive statistical test on it. But one way we could uh, assure ourselves that there is some structure in that data is to graph it. And that's going to be our next activity. In fact, we're going to take a little bit of time to do this activity because after this, uh, will be essentially up to when we're at the question and answer session. I think we're tracking okay for time. Melissa, I think this will take another 10 or 15 minutes. Yes, we're looking really good for time. Thanks, Gareth. So the tool we're going to use, and some of you might be familiar with this name, is ggplot2. ggplot2 is an R-based plotting tool for data, and that the bulk of functionality of ggpplot2 has been incorporated into Galaxy as an executable tool. If you're more familiar with R, you'll see that this version of ggplot2 uh, has less options than R. So you, this might be a time, if you're familiar with R, to export out your data set, your tabular data set, or whichever one we're going to apply. I think it is to tabular from memory. Uh, sorry, to clean data because we're using the heading and, and use that in R. The reason it's in Galaxy is for the core reason of Galaxy, that not everyone is familiar with uh, the syntax of R or coding in Python or bash scripts at command line. So we're going to make tools available inside Galaxy to do things you need to do 
or count to as easily outside of galaxy. So the tool itself is called Scatterplot with ggplot2. This is one of many visualization options that Galaxy have. Um, circus plots are a fantastic way of visualizing chromosome data with variant data and species data on top and can be built iteratively in Galaxy and highly complex. Uh, we have run webinars on that in the past, so please look those up. In this particular case, we're going to set up a couple of values. Again, the inertia is in the setup, the opportunity is in the repeatability, and we are going to just do that repeatability. So we, it says, as a reminder, our input needs to be in tabular format, and that is iris clean. The default is, interestingly enough, columns, uh, uh, so uh, Matt, I'll get to your question when we execute this tool, because it's another great question. Um, the default for this tool, interestingly enough, is columns eight and nine. Um, so hopefully you can all quickly guess what would happen if we run this tool now. It will fail because it cannot find columns eight and nine in your data set. So we do need to tell it which pair of X and Y axis we want to look at. At the risk of not making a mistake, I'm going to bring up Iris Clean, remind myself it does not have a header file and I should know that from the name of the file. So I'm going to come down to the tabular and ask that we plot sepal length versus sepal width. So it's column one versus column two. We can give it a title. And not surprisingly, the title is length as a function of width. And we can title the x axes equal length, equal width. And we could execute there. We're actually doing a few other niceties to our graph. And you might not necessarily know you need to do these in advance. So a very typical journey in Galaxy would be run tool, and then it would be rerun scatterplot after you've seen the initial result and say, actually, I'd prefer different colors. Actually, I'd prefer different dots or different uh, titles. So we're kind of skipping it a little, and we're going to set up a couple of the options, advanced options, in preparation for getting the singular graph we want. So the advanced options by default are collapsed and we're going for type of plot, multiple plots, and we've got access options as well. So we can plot points, lines, or points and lines. We are going for points only, uh, except we're going to define them. And I'll confess completely that these are interesting languages to use. Relative sizes of points doesn't tell you what they're relative to, just we're making them bigger. Uh, we can make them transparent if we wish to, and we can color palette them. So we can get, uh, sorry, color of data points. Let me just check that one. Data point options two. Oh yeah, we are actually, sorry, not modifying that because we're gonna modify something that overwrites this. What uh, caught me out when I was practicing this is uh, that this tool has been updated on Galaxy. It used to only plot circles. Now by default, it plots a lot of other things. We're going to go for circle, but you could plot diamonds, triangles, et cetera, uh, if that is your preference. I, in fact, I want filled circle. So this will produce a graph of everything from column one to and against column two. But we know from our data set that we actually have three unique species in the data. And this particular graph right now will just be all of that. So we can actually ask ggplot2 to plot multiple groups. So just plot the data as one group plot multiple groups on one plot or plot multiple groups on individual. So the third option 
is both great because it means that, uh, so it's great from the point of view that you're asking this particular tool to do one action, but give you many results. So if you wanted a plot per species, great, we're gonna get three plots. Uh, just bear in mind if you wanted to know something about the GC content of every chromosome in the species, you would end up with 24 or 23 plots. So pick this one with caution. We're gonna pick the one in the middle, plot multiple groups of data on one plot. We need to tell the tool, what is the differentiating column? And it is column five. And again, we're kind of skipping to the end. There are many different color schemes you can pick. Um, so that is your personal preference. Following the tutorial, we are using color palette two. I don't know why, we just are. It is the personal preference of the people that wrote the tutorial. We can give titles to the axes, we can give titles to the plot, grid lines, etc. So you can see there's an awful lot you can do to produce a graph here. And the final thing we're going to do is look at our output options. So first of all, you can measure them in different sizes. We're not going to worry about that. You can do the DPI output. And you can also specify uh, the format this comes out in. So it is worth noting that this particular tool can produce you publication printable graphs. So you can do all your customization of axes. You can reach the DPI count you need to for a journal and the file format you need to for a journal. So this isn't just a nicety visualization. You can use this to do that heavy lifting of your publication. Do believe I've got all that set up. So let's run the tool. And this is the first tool I believe today where we now see we get two history items. There's two history items that are identified simply by the file type. Um, but it will not be uncommon in your Galaxy journey to use a tool. And one I'm familiar with is Procker. Um, Procker is a microbial annotation tool and that produces about 15 outputs at once. So yeah, don't, don't be surprised if your history fills up uh, quite dramatically when you execute a tool. Just pause very quickly, Matt, is it possible to provide the command line or R code as an input into Galaxy? No, it is not at this point. Uh, once we get to workflows, you'll see that the way we approach a workflow, there are a number of uh, ongoing global activities to automate the process of translating Nextflow code into Galaxy. Uh, but often you are doing a, a lift and shift of the code out of where you know it works and bringing it into the Galaxy syntax. Uh, a number of us are on a publication that will hopefully be out early next year on looking at the efficiency of coding in Nextflow versus coding in Galaxy in terms of configuration steps that we are hoping will convince people that doing stuff in Galaxy is actually slightly more efficient than the next one. Gareth is Can it to do the opposite and take the R code that you've run in Galaxy and run that in R? Yes, if you're willing to, um, well, in some cases, yeah, it's tool dependent, Melissa. So it's a great question. So here are the options but you'll see the syntax is obviously coded to the physical location of the data set. So as long as you're prepared to modify those, yeah, you'll see everything else is being uh, outputted either in the command line or the tool output. So I guess the short answer is yes. And Mike and I have, I know, both helped researchers who have been stuck at command line with simple syntax misconfigurations and they've seen it in Galaxy and gone, ah, that's what I was missing. So it is very possible to do. Apologies, we're slightly off topic. Let's have a look at our result. We're hoping to create a graph like this and we can rename it, the renaming it that is 
like practice for you now. So here is the PNG file. And you'll note that it's there, but it does not scale well in the middle screen. So Galaxy doesn't always apply an auto rescaling of the image. And so the reason we select the PDF file is because it better auto scales in the window. So this has produced, it's basically a PDF viewer. You'll see it's got all the PDF functions sitting inside Galaxy and you can now navigate or inspect that graph. We could decide we don't like the headings, we don't like the axes. All of that can be done by simply rerunning the tool and modifying whatever function or part of that tool we didn't like when we first saw it. Uh, what we were asked to do, and I will do this uh, just for completeness, is we're asked to rename these data sets. Um, I actually think given that we have two outputs, I slightly and humbly disagree with this statement, rename the data set. So I'm not gonna rename the whole name. I'm gonna still capture that PNG because it's useful for me to know just by inspection of my history, which one is the PDF and which one is the image file. Go. So a little easier to see now. Um, you will also note, and it was probably not obvious, but for those of you writing in command line more frequently, uh, that Galaxy history tolerates spaces. So these don't need to be replaced by underscores. So it does make the English readability of your history items a little easier. So what does the scatter plot tell us? Well, that's really up to you. We can make a new scatter plot and we will do this uh, for the purpose of the exercise now. Make a new scatter plot, this time petal length versus petal width. What does that tell us? So the activity here is to rerun the job again and select new columns. So we do that. Um, and interestingly, we can rerun the job from any of its outputs. So you don't have to pick a particular output to rerun the job. If there was 10 outputs, just grab any one of them because it's the tool you're rerunning, not that specific output. Still RS clean. I'm going to come to the bottom of my history, remind myself that petal length is column three, petal width is column four. So this is three versus four. Rename my title very quickly. Oops. Right. And nothing else changes, or I don't want anything else to change at this point. And I'm going to run that tool again. Here we get two more history items items will pop in, there they are now. They've got that same language, and this is where that value in renaming items at manually at this point or after the break where we do it more efficiently comes in. And now we can inspect the pedal length as an image and pedal length as the PDF viewer. I'm just gonna turn that off the tool menu. That will allow my screen to expand a bit more once that turns off. And now you can quite see that petal length does absolutely uh, differentiate these three species a little better, particularly uh, the Satosa species away from the other two. You can actually bring these up in multiple windows. Uh, you can use this one, the window manager to do that. Um, you can export it. Um, yeah, it's personal preference. So I think that's a great tip you've provided there, which is to right click and open in a new tab. And I'm really pleased people are discovering ways to use Galaxy. So awesome. But we have built this history iteratively on a data set and we're focused on the flowers. Now what we want to do is take that conceptual leap and say, if we routinely expect in our analysis 
a file structure, which is five columns, four columns of numerical value or measurable quantities and a fifth column that's categorical, can I actually set a workflow up in Galaxy that allows me to run all of this with a single click uh, very efficiently based on uh, accepting a routine data type? And absolutely, this is something that as you expect from a sequencing center routinely, Illumina paired data in a genomic space or Brooker multi-TOF mass spec data. How can I set up uh, a workflow that accepts that data type over and over again and does a certain number of bulk activities on it? I could read it out. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there a risk of records in a tabular data set being scrambled when the columns are separated? Um, I love a good black and white answer. The answer is maybe. So it's completely great. Um, I guess there is a, rec a risk for you as an individual user of Galaxy to misname a particular column you've pulled out. So we renamed this particular column, column species column, and we were confident we did that. But in a many column file, obviously you may make that error you do have provenance. And that's, I think, the relative thing. So you can come through that information button and see what you cut column five based on a tab from a particular data set. So if you were ever concerned partway through your history that your analysis wasn't quite lining up and maybe you picked the wrong input file, it might be scrambled, which is a great word to use, scrambled for your interpretation, but it's not going to be scrambled from Galaxy's province. So you can always go back and see exactly where you've got that data from. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Gareth. We also have a question. They are analysing 100 species and facing some issues with uh, memory, uh, specifically for transcriptome assembly. How can you get access to more space on Galaxy? Also another great question. Um, so uh, I'll translate your question. Uh, I guess this the question I'm reading in two ways. So there's uh, memory, which could mean the memory allocated to a tool if you're trying to analyze a hundred species at a time. If that is the case and you get a red box in your history, then please do submit that as an error report to us at Galaxy um, and uh, say, this job looks like it's out of memory. Can I please get more space? Uh, sorry, get more resources allocated to the job. Uh, I'm going to just try and replicate that right now. Um, but your second part of the question, how do I get more space? possibly refers to your quota up here on your screen. So, and there we, so let me just address the first point. This is what an error looks like if no one has been fortunate enough to generate an error yet. It's in angry red and it has something. It tells me here under the information, pardon me, sorry. When you get an error, you get a new icon and that new icon is a bug. You can click on the bug and it will give you some details of the error, gives you the tool, the code and why. And if you're unsure, you can submit this to Galaxy Australia. You can provide as much information as you want. Uh, I'm with Gareth, try and follow along, whatever you want to write. You submit that, that goes to our ticket system. You'll get an email that your ticket's been registered. Someone will explore your error. You might also be able to troubleshoot the error yourself. In this particular case, if you're willing to read through the error, it says error in names, column eight was selected, but the total number of columns is only five. And that might be a clue that you've picked the wrong column. You would go back, rerun the tool and pick appropriate columns for your analysis. So that is a typical error that we'll see in Galaxy. Um, if, I think, cause it was a two part question, um, 
which is about storage on the server. This is your quota on your screen here. If all of you have a look up, yours would probably be hovering around one or 2%, or if you're already using Galaxy and getting a refresher, it'll be higher. When this reaches 100%, uh, yeah, you cannot run any more jobs. Please contact us for a larger quota. You will find that under the home page under support. This is this request page. And one of these here is need more data storage on Galaxy Australia, please ask. So we just ask how much more would you like? And more importantly, how long do you think you need this for? Because uh, we are operating our total storage on behalf of everyone in Australia. We have nearly over 35,000 registered users. So this is a responsible service. Uh, please tell us how much you need, how long for, and we'll do our best efforts to uh, facilitate that. We are also in the process by the end of the year, building very large clutches with temporary timeframes. So if you need to bring terabytes of data, we'll give you scratch space. Um, which you can do your analysis in. But yeah, if you are running to this block, please request, and that's the form. Uh, on this ground, what is the risk of row or being changed when using these tools? Um, again, love a good gray answer. Um, so I'm going to say maybe you might be thinking of the tool where we asked for the result to be sorted, which I think was one of the grouping tools. So yes, there is that risk. However, given that nothing's overwritten in your history and you can always go back to the source material, it depends on what you want to do on that data set. And if you're going to refer to the source or refer to the computed result. Uh, okay, no, I mean the cut and data type changes. I'm gonna say no, that's probably the easiest answer. Galaxy won't just automatically reorder by uh, numerical value or alphabet. It, its index order is what you give it. Um, so hopefully the basics, it sounds like some of you might already be familiar with Galaxy about how to use a tool, how to rerun a tool, how to explore the tool options, explore the tool information, that's all been explained to you. Now, what you would have observed I really is we were doing a step-by-step -step process and it was relatively quick and it's deliberately relatively quick because it's a training event. You can imagine if you're bringing large amount of data that waiting necessarily for one step to finish before executing the next is going to be laborious and particularly inefficient. So at its core, uh, Galaxy isn't really a uh, a single tool operation service. Galaxy is a workflow engine. Uh, workflows, if you've heard of them before, uh, often called pipelines as well in the Galaxy language, it is a workflow. So the tutorial we're using today, we paused at the stage of extracting a workflow. And we're gonna go through as a learning activity or a learning outcome, to look at multiple ways that one can generate a workflow. So I'm just gonna cover those off so you can see where we're headed. The first one is the activity we're going to perform now, which is you have established that the history you have by and large uh, is either perfectly usable in the future or mostly usable in the future. So you wanna extract the workflow from that history and then we're going to apply that workflow to a new data set. Uh, I also do want to take the time to show you some of the other places or ways you can bring a workflow into Galaxy. That includes sharing with your colleagues. So someone can make a workflow uh, that you might be interested with it and share it directly in Galaxy with you. We're going to go uh, to a repository called Workflow Hub, and I'll show you how to download a workflow externally into your Galaxy. And and the last arm of this exercise is we will work in the workflow canvas, which is the editable screen from workflows where you'll see 
and can actually build them from scratch if you have a, a vision for what you want your workflow to do. So in the first instance, the tutorial, which we're still broadly following, is going to ask us to extract a workflow. Um, it's got some helpful advice here, like clean up your history of any red failed jobs. This makes the creation of a workflow easier. This is true, but it's not critical to the activity, but we'll see what we'll do in a minute. We're going to explore the history options and under the history options, which I'll talk through the other options in a minute, is extract workflow. It will pull out a screen that looks like this, workflow constructed from history X. And it can be a little confusing to read because now it's cascades down on the screen instead of upwards in your galaxy history. But it essentially says we have a data set, we applied various tools to it, and we would like to see this reproduced as a workflow. All right, so back into our galaxy. We have our workflow, everyone, Mine probably has a couple more steps in it than yours because I've talked about a few other things. In particular, it does actually have two deleted items. Uh, I'm going to leave them here so you can see the options that are presentable. But the best advice probably is in the tutorial, which is to delete these here. So we haven't discussed many of the options at the top half of the screen here. Most of this is, is Galaxy 201 or Advanced Galaxy, um, but this particular menu is well worth uh, spending a minute on. So this is your history uh, options. Quite a few in here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, simply to remind you that you can share them with colleagues. Uh, you can archive your history, you can export it out of Galaxy so you can keep it yourself. And again, if this is your finalized data set, then we highly recommend that you do actually uh, archive, uh, sorry, export it to your university storage or export it to your, well, not necessarily personal computer because that may not be as secure as we like. Copy and delete should be fairly obvious. And I'm going to take a chance just on this history export option at the moment called export tool citations. The export tool citations may populate, but I suspect it won't. Yeah, that's right. We're going to come back to this one. This is a very powerful feature for finding all the primary publications associated with the tools that you ran in Galaxy. I don't want to segue too much, so I won't dive into this. We'll come back to this in the, the dying few minutes. And if not, Melissa, please do remind me um, because I think there's high value in this for, for anyone conducting their own research on Galaxy to know what the source material for the tools are. Right, so we have been asked by the tutorial to go to extract workflow. Oh, and it finally refresh as we were talking. That's okay. We'll come back to that one regardless. Okay, so extract workflow has workflow constructed from history and you can see it's pulled the history name in. Uh, we've been asked to give this workflow a, a lengthier name, which is exploring I IRIS data sets with statistics and scatter plots. I'm going to do that. Um, and the history has a number of items in it. So it had bring in data, we're going to call this data iris, we're going to convert CS to tabular, remove beginning, cut, run our particular unique and groups. And this was a little repetitive, so we may not want all of these steps, but that's okay, they're there for the moment. There's our data mesh, there's our scatter plot, there's our scatter plot, and here's the scatter plot that I deliberately failed. So I can just turn this off so that it's not included in my workflow. And that's fairly easy. It's there at the end, it failed. It doesn't matter if I include it or not. So it's exactly the same way as deleting the items over here. I'm just showing you a separate option for how 
to do this particular activity. And I'm going to create workflow. Creating the workflow is pretty quick. Um, and the screen encourages you to edit or run. I will encourage you basically never to run a workflow you've created, but not visualized yourself. Um, not for any other reason than they're wasting your own time, potentially, if it's not configured how you want to. So let's have a look at editing the workflow. And that's what it'll be saying here. Create the workflow, find it in your workflow menu, come to the workflow editor. Later, I will show you the import function, but I'd like to show you the edit first. So here is our workflow that we create on what Galaxy calls its workflow canvas. Um, if your workflow is very large, fairly easy to zoom in or out. That only works off your mouse ball or scroll ball. You can zoom around the uh, thumbnail view. And more importantly, uh, when you move an item on your history, its symbolic link to what you processed or what you asked the Galaxy to do is maintained. So it doesn't actually matter where I put these on the screen because the actual result is by these noodles that connect items of the history, uh, sorry, the workflow together. They have a start and an end. If you hover over the end of a pre-established connection, you can delete that connection if you decide that you don't need that input going into that tool. You can re-establish that by just hovering your mouse over the output. The end goes green. If you click your mouse and hold it down, you get a noodle. And you may notice on my screen that a number of items go orange. That's to say this is already occupied. You cannot use input another option. Or green, so this is currently unoccupied and will accept an input. Once I let go, those two are linked again. If you're getting a little lost because I just scrambled everything on the screen, there are options to just do auto layout where everything will be spaced out nicely. So let's have a look. We had our input data. We converted to CSV. We did a data mesh operation to establish the means and standard deviations. We did that actually after all this other stuff, but that doesn't matter in the workflow language. It's just that that is an operation we performed on this file. We removed the beginning. We ran group twice. We ran scatter plot once. We ran scatter plot again. We ran cut and unique. We did all of these things on that data set. So now, hopefully, it's not too hard to imagine that if we had another piece of data that was five columns, four columns of numbers, column of identifier with a header line, we can run all of this again with a single play button. And that is what we're going to do. I know I promised we're going to come back to these particular options here in a minute, just so I'm not jumping around too much. So when we have our workflow, we now can start to think about this as being more generic than the individual history we had. And what might we want to do to make this workflow something that one, we can run, and two, more importantly, when it's concluded, we can quickly get to the salient results. So uh, one of the important features here and we'll go back to the workflow so it's more obvious, is if a tool has a lot of outputs which are used by other steps, like here, like remove any, we don't necessarily need to see that file in our face, in our history, when we open it up, once the workflow is finished. Everything in a workflow will be an output. Some of those outputs can be uh, 
visualized automatically. Some of them can be pushed into a hidden state, but they'll all be generated. So if you want to see a result, turn it on. Come on, sorry, there we go. You may not want to see all the results. You may want to name some of the results so they come out more, more intelligently. We may not want the PNG, we may only want the PDF, which I can turn on in both cases. This can be a very powerful way, as I just want to enforce, every single one of these results is going to be produced. Only some of them will be seen on first view once the workflow is completed. That's what this particular section is talking about, that you can uh, hide certain intermediate outputs or outputs you're not particularly keen on seeing straight away. And you can also preemptively name those outputs so that they're more intelligent for you and you don't need to go through that process of using the pencil icon to actively modify each step. So the output of the tool unique gave us categorical information in our case on species, but it gave us essentially just categorical information. So we can find that tool called unique. Here it is. And we can modify it. And I'll explain all this in a minute. I'll just do the activity so that the output is renamed categories. So this now, when the workflow is completed, instead of getting unique counts on data set seven, this history item will be called categories. You'll know where to find it and what to look in it and what you expect to see in that output. Now, it was not obvious that I came to the right-hand screen side of my screen to take that action. So let me just pause for a sec. Each time I click on a box in my workflow, the right-hand side that used to be my history menu now becomes the full toolbox options. So here it is here, toolbox for cut, toolbox for scatter plot, and every option available in here is what you would experience in the tool menu. So in this particular case, this is a scatter plot. This is columns three and four, petal length versus petal width, length, length, output options. I can actually essentially hard code what I want to see in my workflow now here without having to do it back in the history. So I might look at this and say, uh, scatter plot with ggplot2, Column three and four is great, but in fact, I'm not confident that the next data set I'm going to apply this to is plants. So I'm going to say column three as a function of column four. That would be one way to make this generic, possibly too generic, and you'll see we can do other things in a minute, but this is an option to make this particular function in a workflow generic enough to then be applied to multiple data sets. That's essentially what that's saying. It did also ask us to do redo groups. So let's just do that to, so that we're not drifting from the tutorial. We're changing group from output file one to samples per category. So let's find group in our history, here they are here. Currently they're going to be called out file one. Let's check the tool because we have two versions of the tool. This one is counting on column five, but not doing any operations. This one is counting on column five, but it's doing a lot of operations, counting on column one. So this is the one where we want to rename because this is the one that actually did the counting. Configure output, rename data set to samples per category. I don't need to save or anything, by the way. I don't need to save to capture that change, I mean. 
And arguably, since this particular group is a little redundant, I might want to get rid of this from my workflow because it's not really adding a great deal of value. To do that, I could either symbolically break the link and now it's an orphan tool, or I could just delete, pardon me, remove or delete that tool from the workflow. And it's gone and now I'm a little cleaner. So I've gone and done that. It, the rem reminder, I've done them in reorder. I did unique, then I renamed the scatter plot, then I did group, but I've done all those three options. Save your workflow in brackets important by clicking the save icon. That is true. But if you attempt to navigate away from this page inside Galaxy by using the back button, you will be prompted that it is not saved. Right now, saved is grayed out because it, I can leave. If I move group on my screen, you'll see save has come as an option again because I've made a change. If I try to leave, I'll be prompted that the workflow is not saved. So fairly good practice to save all the time, but you will be prevented from large errors uh, by just by Galaxy itself. Return to the main menu and run it on different data. So we can return to the main menu via the home button or the Galaxy Australia button. Both of them will do the same. That will take us back to our default, which was our history, the middle panel, our tool. If we needed to find that workflow again, we have a workflow menu across the top. Depending on what you've got in here, it's how long it will take to load. So you can see I have at least four versions, oh, sorry, three versions of this particular workflow created in the last half a day or so. I can tag them. I can copy them, download them, share them, edit them, or run them. I also am told how many times I've ever run this workflow, which is actually kind of handy. So before we get too distracted and start executing this workflow, um, I do want to show you that, oh, sorry, that you can bring in workflows from elsewhere. So inside your workflow menu, you can have workflows shared with yourself. So those are workflows that someone else has shared. And here are some in here that I have. You can have publicly accessible workflows. And I have many of those and they often have richer tags because of where they've come from, but I can import a workflow. And there are multiple ways to import a workflow. You can do it from specific servers or via IDs, or if you know the location of that workflow, you can just bring it in by URL. So the one I chose, I'll just escape out of my presentation is at Workflow Hub. I actually think I grabbed this one almost at random. No, sorry. Yeah, there we go. So if you're not familiar, Workflow Hub is, well, one, it's awesome. Two, it's a repository of workflows and not necessarily just Galaxy workflows. So common workflow type, CW, WL, Galaxy, Chime, Nextflow, SnakeMake, and 24 others. So it is a repository for workflows, not a Galaxy specific database. You can search on a workflow, you can search on RNA seq, which is what I did, and find out how many people have generated or contributed RNA seq workflows. There are 91 of those. And then you can go through and ask, where are they? So there's one that's run in Australia on NCI Gaudi um, from Sydney Informatics Hub. Here's a Galaxy one out of the Intergalactic, Intergalactic Galaxy group, et cetera. So there's many here, depending on workflow language, CWL, et cetera. 
So when I was setting this up, I found this one yesterday, QC and trimming of RNA seq reads from the Threatened Species Initiative Australia, written by Luke Silver in Sydney and Anna Simon in Melbourne as part of the Galaxy Australia team. You can see what the workflow does, how it's updated. You get a visualization on that workflow, and this one's a lot more complex than what we have set up. And you can download it. So let me just find it. Files, here we are. Main workflow. I don't actually need to necessarily download the workflow as long as I can get a uh, URL that directs me to that .ga file. Now, given this is hosted on GitHub, um, those files will come in uh, not directly. Sorry, I'm stumbling on my words. The, uh, you cannot import this as a GitHub ID. You can port it as text, or you would find it in Workflow Hub as a .ga version. You can also run it on Galaxy, and that will take you to the Galaxy Europe server and allow you to import it. We're working to bring that into Galaxy Australia. So there are ways you can do the same from the GTN. This workflow, sorry, the tutorial we're working on has a workflow. It's listed here under the supporting materials. You can grab that there. Sorry, importing into Galaxy, where is the link? Download it to get to yourself. Use it on Galaxy Australia, import to another server. So I can copy this link address. I know you can't see me pointing at my screen, but down the bottom of my screen, you might be able to read there's a long URL and it ends in the language .ga. So all I need to do is copy that address, bring it into Australia, paste that into the URL as .ga, and import the workflow. It says it'll take a few minutes, but very rarely takes that long. And here it is in my Galaxy history. And I can edit or view that workflow. You can do that from Workflow Hub, depending on which part of it you want to grab. It's in here, it's here as IDs. You can explore this as version history. You can do it from the GTN. You can do it from anywhere that someone is hosting a workflow. Right, so apologies, that was a little bit of a segue. Let me get back on track and come down to where we're at. So we've edited our workflow, we've manipulated it in a number of ways. Now, really the big test of our workflow is can I run this workflow successfully, but on a different data set? So to do that, we are going to import a new data set into Galaxy Australia. Uh, we're going to be asked to create a new history, give it a name, give it whatever your name you want. The clue to this is that the data set we're bringing in is called Diamonds. And we're going to bring in a data set called Diamond CSV. So creating a new history in Galaxy is as simple as using the plus icon to create a new history. It is currently unnamed. I will edit that. I'll give it actually something a little bit better like Galaxy 101 Diamonds by Common Straining 2024 -08 The history is empty and we need to bring in a data set. It is the diamonds data set. So I'm just gonna copy that URL into memory, come to my upload functionality, paste and fetch data and bring in diamonds and start. Same functionality. The tool form, which is upload, goes green to say that command has been executed. In the background, 
Galaxy is now brokering with Zenodo to pull that data in. Um, so this function takes as long as the size of your data set is. And there we go. Diamond CSV has come into the server. And again, I'd be practicing what I'm preaching. It's 53,940 lines long. It seems to have a headline and it has values like carrot, price, color, clarity, and cut. So it has four line, four columns of data, one column of categorical values. It looks conveniently like our previous data set. It is, however, significantly harder for us to manually inspect this data. It is loading, it's just loading a slightly larger file. And it's nigh on impossible for me to do any manual inspection of this and assure myself that this data is anything that I can interpret visually without doing some work on it. So yes, we set it up on 150 line file. Now we're applying it to 53, 54,000 lines. Uh, and I, incidentally, when we set up workflows for ourselves, we do this as well. We subset our sequencing data. We subset our mass spec data. We test and build a history on a subset of that data, and then we rerun it as a workflow on a large data set. So this is actually very common practice. What do we need to do? Well, we can still go to the effort of renaming this to diamonds and drop the CS. And we can add a propagating tag of hashtag diamonds. We'll do both of those because it's just a good reminder of that activity. I'm just going to drop the CSV. Again, I could put into annotation where I got this file from because that's good practice. And add a hashtag diamonds. <clears throat> Pardon me. Oops. There we go. I actually think this works better if you run the diamond data set in the same history as you had Iris, because then you get to see the tags in the same data set, our uh, same history, but it works fine here. So we have brought our data in, we've renamed it, we've added a propagating tag, and now we can go through some effort of reading in the tutorial why these values matter. Um, if you're particularly passionate about diamonds, go for it. If this represents simply a learning exercise, we can move past this. What we really want to do is run our workflow on this data. So we're going to find our workflow. We could find it here on the side menu or here on the top menu. They're all the same. We're looking for the one that not I imported, but the one uh, called Exploring Iris Datasets with Statistics and Scatter Plots. And this is the one that we manipulated only a few minutes ago. Arguably, looking at this history, this workflow now, I could decide that this name is not particularly useful. I might actually call this Exploring, uh, I could even go as far as saying four column numerical and categorical uh, and metadata. There you go. Metadata set with statistics. That's only for my own benefit. Thinking about it as iris means I might not remember to apply it to the uh, diamond data set. I could edit it. I don't need to. I'm going straight to the run workflow option. And now we're presented with a different type of menu. So first of all, uh, we're presented with a very similar Galaxy idea. What file or files do I have to apply this to? And I acknowledge we haven't really discussed multiple files or other options. So we're working on diamonds and we could hit run because we believe with confidence we've set our workflow up correctly or Never be afraid to inspect your workflow form. Uh, goes through a little bit more detail about what to expect. 
There are some really great options in here. Um, and I'll spend a minute to talking about this one. I'm not going to worry about job rerun. And then we're going to talk about checking on the tool options. So send results to a new history. Super powerful function. If you turn it on, you can name that history immediately and you'll see it's named according to the workflow and not according to the current history. What this allows you to do is potentially have workflows set up that critique the same data set, but in different options. So uh, a real example from my own uh, workflows is assembling a genome with different levels of uh, tolerance for repetitive regions in the genome. So I could have done this in one behemoth workflow. I chose to have a separate workflow for each tolerance level of repeat regions. And I executed each of those workflows on a different, uh, on the same data set. So I could look at the results. This way I can send the new data to a new history. So I might call this low repetition genome, send to new history, execute workflow two, medium repetition genome, send to new history. So if you want to overanalyze or reanalyze your same data again and again, sending it to a new history can be a great way of separating out all your results. In this case, we're not going to do that. We're working in the one history. All right. On review of my workflow, now I realize that maybe calling my input iris wasn't a great idea. If I'm going to use this workflow again, and I certainly will, I might go back and rename this input file. I could even go as far as giving some metadata to say input file. Please remember it needs four columns of numbers, one column of categorical. And I can go through each of the steps and check they're right. In this particular case, it is reminding me that my scatter plots might need some better names because the scatter plots were keyed to plant. I'd already gone ahead and named one of them, column three versus column four. Done, great. But I had not gone and renamed this particular one, which was column one versus column two, is still called sequel length as a function of sequel width, which does not apply to this data set. Even though the workflow is set, if you see the pencil icon, that's probably a clue now that this is an option that you can modify. So we can rename the plot title. Diamond price is a function of carrot and cut. And we can rename X axis from sepal length and width. We're going to check over here. In fact, it's not carrot with cut. As a factor, it's carrot. Oh, sorry, it is. It's price is a function of carrot with cut as the factor, which is the categorical. So X axis, title of X axis is carrot. That's column one. I'm as you can see by my mouse, possibly I'm eyeballing my data set. I'm making sure I'm setting it up correctly. And this one is price. In fact, you could go as far as saying in US dollars, you don't necessarily need to. So we, uh, they went for slightly longer titles. That's okay, I've gone for the short version, but what I'm showing you is that you can modify these on the fly. So you can set up a bulk workflow, but you can always tweak it uh, subtly for the things you need. Still getting our PDFs, we're getting everything else we need. Customize the second plot. Yeah, it's reminding us to do all the things we've already done. Then it says, once your workflow is started, you'll initially see all its steps, but the unimportant intermediates will disappear after they complete successfully. So if you remember, we did turn a few of them off. So yeah, this happens all very quickly. So I'm going to talk at it before executing it. When I hit what run workflow, my history is going to fill up with nine more items. 
or at least nine more tools. It could be many more items if each of those tools produce a lot of outputs. We're also going to see a feature that's only been in practice for a few weeks now. So I quite like watching this because it's kind of cool. You're actually going to see a live version of the workflow working. Not entirely sure how useful it is. It's just cool, so bear with me on that one. So run workflow. Here's my workflow here. My history is filled up with 11 items. They're all queued up. They're going to stay gray if they need a previous step because they're waiting for information. Or as it's happening on my screen right now, the live history view is updating. The jobs complete is updating. This is all being populated and rushing through. Now in a very small data set like this, maybe this particular view isn't so interesting. On a one where you might be looking at two, four, eight hour processing steps, this should allow you to jump in and see how your data's going. With that, not a surprise, that happened all very quickly. I have a full history now. I have hopefully informative names like category 11, uh, sorry, step 11 is categories. I have some that aren't so informative where I could rename them uh, and that's fine. We would go to that effort, but let's just inspect these just to prove it all worked. There are five qualities of, oh, sorry, five categories of cut. And we can now visualize some scatter plots. And in this case, we're now plotting 53, nearly 54,000 points of data. Um, so if it takes a little longer to come up, that's simply because it's just rendering a bit more information. But you can see how quickly in this particular case, the workflow was generated, but more importantly, from your point of view as a user, your interaction was two or three clicks to make 11 different steps happen without you needing to be involved. So setting up a workflow is super powerful. Uh, it happened so quickly, you probably didn't notice or I didn't get a chance to explain that, yeah, things will stay queued waiting for previous data. So you don't need to wait. Galaxy has its own job scheduling system in the background and it will queue up everything appropriately as needed. You've now got your whole history. You can come and inspect and work out if you've got the kind of data you were hoping to, you've got the distribution. In this case, the distribution is very different and not even a cut. You could come and look at the, uh, sorry, the other piece of information, which is gonna be hard for me to find because we didn't name everything, uh, which is the data mesh. There it is uh, with all the mean and standard deviations. And if you're a little lost, you also have your workflow invocations. So these are the number of times you've run a workflow when you have, and you can go back and explore it. So in this particular case, this is the one we just ran. Shows me everything ran well. I can check, will I get scrambled? Well, here's my input. I can check my outputs. And I, in fact, can check a report, which is auto-generated by Galaxy. That shows me what were my input data sets, what were my outputs, including the data mesh, including the counts, and including the graphs is all auto-generated for you in the workflow report. So uh, this is a great place to come at the end of your uh, workflow. You can also key your workflow to email you when it's finished. And I highly recommend that as well, because if a workflow takes a long time, you'll get that notification. It's done. So I'm just going to double check. Um, I'll quickly show you build a workflow from scratch, but it really is nothing that you haven't really already seen. It's simply uh, an extension of what we did before. So the blank canvas is here. The input is a data set that is generic. 
The tool can be anything. I will pick Fast QC. You're picking your tools on the left side. They populate the canvas. You manipulate the tool on the right hand side, as discussed before. You link your input to the tool and you have created a workflow. That's it. That's as simple as working from a blank canvas. As I said, you kind of have to have some vision of what that workflow looks like. And I guess in operation, we see the most popular way this happens is someone taking a workflow from a paper, which isn't in Galaxy and saying, I would like to reproduce this analytical flow from a paper. How can I do it in Galaxy step, step, step? That's everything I wanted to really show inside Galaxy. I have a couple of little things I wanted to share at the end, just um, to try and counter the fact that we've been working on some very basic CSV files and to try and give you an understanding of some of what Galaxy can do. Uh, so I'm gonna show this in slides and show it in Galaxy as well. Um, so beside our little academic hat icon, uh, there's this little hex icon um, or D20 icon, if you remember your Dungeons and Dragons. This allows you to navigate to subsets or labs that we've built inside Galaxy Australia. So we've currently built three labs, the genome lab, the single cell lab, and the proteomics lab. Um, the idea behind these labs I'm being prompted to save my workflow because I've been naughty and not saved it. So I'm still going to force a leave. The idea behind the labs is that Galaxy has grown substantially over the years. It has a tool menu, as I said before, with nearly 2,000 tools. And maybe uh, that means that a percentage of our users come and there's just a little bit too much to absorb about Galaxy. Uh, so we've built three landing pages, genome, proteome, single cell, where if this is your primary field of work, proteomics, come to the proteomics lab, get started here. You're going to give, be given hopefully a few more useful jogs of how to convert uh, mass spec file types, how to do different tools. You get the tool types. You can run that as a tool or a workflow. Yeah, help sections is an explanation on how to analyze max quant data, and that will take you to the GTN from memory. Um, so yeah, the labs are designed uh, if you need a start place for a domain of research. We will be building more of these. We have in discussion a fungal one, we have in discussion a microbial one. If you have a particular interest in a particular domain, get in contact with us. Here's the genome lab. This one has uh, workflows that have been sanctioned and built in Australia uh, for threatened species uh, to manipulate PAC bio data or nanopore and Illumina data. The important thing is that everything that is in Galaxy, as in all the computation in the back end, all your history, all your workflows, all your shared data, doesn't matter which of the Galaxy labs or sites you're on, that's all the same. This is just a convenient place to come and work in a domain that you want to work in. So those, those exist. Please do explore, use them and give feedback. And I did kind of mention resources there and deliberately so uh, what underpins Galaxy, for those of you that are interested, uh, we're actually hosted on our operational partner, Arnet, at their, uh, one of their data centers in Sydney. That's where this is all served out of. But uh, not all our compute resources reside at Arnet. We have compute resources at QCIP, NCI, University of Melbourne, and PAUSI. And depending on the size of your job, or uh, be it the file size or the memory needs of that job, or in the case of the QCIF nodes who have been very generous in providing us a large number of uh, GPU uh, capacity, your job will be sent to that infrastructure and the results sent back to the head node for you to inspect. Uh, one of the things I'm relatively proud of um, being a very big island 
is none of your data is sent out of the country. So if your grant has data sovereignty concerns around where your data can be analyzed or hosted, uh, you can be assured on Galaxy Australia, it's all hosted uh, within our geographical bounds. But yeah, it is great that all our partners have volunteered uh, or paid or allowed us to access such large amounts of their compute resources. That, my wrap up slides, is to just remind you how to get help. So our primary source of contact is help at genome.edu.au. Um, that will take you to our help desk. You'll get generated a ticket. Um, there is help at galaxyproject.org, which will take you to an online uh, forum, uh, bulletin board. That's the word I'm trying to think of which does have a subsection for Australia, but it's particularly useful if you want to um, ask fellow operators of Galaxy how to do something or to search on similar problems that other people have come across in processing a data type or doing an analytical option. And if you're one of the more technical people on this call that really want to get into the nuts and bolts of Galaxy um, on matrix slash element, uh, this will take you to the Galaxy project lobby. Uh, uh, where you can join the Galaxy community for discussing operation of Galaxy and, and really complex questions if needed. With that, um, Mike has been kind enough to be here and, and catching anything we need today, but Galaxy is actually delivered by 10 of us in Australia, the core team and a, a large support team around us. And we distributed all throughout Australia and Sri Lanka as a team. So yeah. This is not a single person effort. It's actually quite a large collective. So thank you to the team. And I think Melissa, I throw back to you. Yes, thanks, Gareth. And then also, Gareth, you wanted to mention the export tool citation function. I did. Thank you very much for keeping me honest. I will just bring that back up. So this is a particular microbial data set. This is a full. Uh, this is not a training data set. This is a clinical samples from Northern Territory Hospital that we analyze on Galaxy Australia. And once we've run the various tools, FastQC, Spades, Proca, Abricate, that export tool citations option in a history gives me all the primary publications associated with the tools I used in my history. So two, two parts. One, I can always go to that paper to see was this tool written and am I uh, written to be appropriately applied to the data I have? Or two, has it you know been updated? Or three, I simply need to shove this in my thesis and here is your tool citation list. So it comes out in two different formats depending on what you need, but it is always supplied in Galaxy if that tool has a primary publication. So thank you, Melissa, for that reminder. We also encourage everybody to cite Galaxy if you are using that in your research. Getting that into your publications is really important for us to demonstrate that you need Galaxy and to uh, attract funding to keep it there for you in the future. And there is information on the Galaxy Australia website on how to cite Galaxy Australia. So as I mentioned, if you want to learn more about using Galaxy for your own research, the Galaxy Training Network is a really fantastic place to start. We also run regular events on Galaxy and you can find the information about those on the BioCommons website. So that just leaves me to thank you for joining us and to thank Gareth and Mike once again for their time this afternoon and to acknowledge that BioCommons is enabled by NCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia funding. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. But until then, Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and goodbye for now.